unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word.
Sing it. Ah. 
more time and say, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Bible is the book of Revelations chapter 3. If you're there, you say, Amen. Hallelujah. Today, I'm going to share a very, 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 very complicated sermon. Okay, I'm going to share it in its simplicity. Okay? So don't worry. It will be simple for you, but it will be complicating. In its own way. Don't worry. It will be simple, okay? So, don't fear. But it's, it's very dear to me, okay? Praise the Lord Jesus. You see, even in this gospel we preach, there are such things as milestones. Milestones are things that are so distinctively defining a particular course of your life um, because of the way the Lord lays them upon your spirit. And thus I speak that some of these things are, are very important to me. Revelation chapter 3. Let's read uh, from the 14th verse. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, this is an instruction to John. He says, This thing says, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of my gold 
in me, sorry, of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou madest be rich and white raiment, that thou madest be clothed, that the same of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes. Hallelujah. Anoint thine eyes with that. I what? I self, that thou mayst what? See. That means they're blind. As, may, as, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore, and what? Repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with the Father in his throne, that he that has an ear, let him want hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a direct message instructed to John the Revelator about what is about the church of Laodicea. Okay? And the scriptures at the end tell us that let him that has ears hear what the Spirit is what saying to the churches. Meaning that outwardly it is telling us what the church of Laodicea is, but in the Spirit there is a very distinctive explanation that the Lord wants us to understand rather than just be lost in the rhetoric of what meets the eye when you read it. Hallelujah. And so it is with all scripture. All scripture has a place of you are reading things up front, but inside the Spirit of the Lord has to be saying something. And that which is said is what we define as revelation. Now, some people don't understand the book of Revelations. Okay? And being a student of, of church history, I've understood very well that everybody has put this book of Revelations in their own time frames to fit their individual doctrines. And some are not wrong. It's only the direction and light from whence they see. Okay? That is not enough to say that we're disqualifying them. That is only to appreciate that everybody sees the Christ differently. Are you hearing me? That is why you have four Gospels. The way Mark sees him is not the way Luke sees him. Luke sees the Son of Man. Mark sees the what? For those of you who read the Bible, what does Mark see? The servant of the Lord. What does Matthew see? The king of the Jews. What does John see? The one which is from above. You understand? So distinctively, if John is defining... For example, and he's, 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 he's speaking about who the Christ is. You realize that Matthew begins from the genealogy. And this is the genealogy, okay, of, 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 of who? Jesus Christ, the son of what? David, son of Abraham. That's where he begins from. And it starts from lineage. That is his definition, okay? But you see, when you go to John, John says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. You understand? That's why he begins from. John begins from a beginning before Genesis. In fact, if you want to read some of the oldest distinctions of knowledge that are in the book of John, John recorded things even Moses didn't register. You understand? Because Moses begins at the place where the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the earth. And while he was hovering over the earth, the Lord says, let there be, and creation was done. John begins from a place before the foundation of the world. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and he, the Word, was God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and nothing was made, was made without Him. For all things were made by Him. He was the light, the life, it shines in darkness. Darkness comprehended Him not. And He tells us, and He was the light, the life was the light. You understand? And He became flesh, and we beheld His only glory as the only true Son of God, full of grace and truth. Those scriptures explain a beginning way older than the foundations of the world. Because it says, in the beginning was the Word. Are you hearing me? Your Genesis has, in the beginning... The earth was without form. You, Moses begins from a place of the earth. John begins from an eternal place. Are you hearing me? So, some people, you ask them, what is the oldest book in the Bible? Some of them want to think it's Genesis, okay? No. Hallelujah. You might even dig deep and be shocked at, at some of the things that are written in the scriptures, okay? Probably, if you want to debt, that's different if you're dealing with a debt issue. But if you want to go to the entity of context... Aligned with eternity, some of these men saw things way, way older than their time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Say amen. amen. So it depends on how the minister of the gospel sees. So it is with the book of Revelation. Okay? Everybody wants to see or everybody can see and everybody will see as to probably what the Lord wants to minister to them. If they are aligned enough to the spirit of truth. Because therein again I've seen the biggest corruption in the body of Christ. Remember the scriptures are clear. The scriptures say that men have been corrupted from the simplicity which is in Christ. 
The Bible says they've not been led away, they've been corrupted. Okay? That is why it says, but I fear least by any means as the serpent beguiled it through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In other words, whenever we, we complicate Christ, we're corrupting men off his simplicity. Christ is supposed to be simple. Why? Because the beginning of the knowledge of Christ is from a faith perspective. It is not from a human power and strength. The Bible says not that we are sufficient of anything to know as of anything of ourselves, but the sufficiencies of God which has made us ego ministers of the new covenant. That means we have the divine ability. We have an action from on high. We know all things. The simplicity of the gospel is not necessarily the presenting of, of the things that are so shallow. To people. Some people mistake that as simplicity. Me, I preach a simple gospel. But you see, what is defining as simple is actually a shallow gospel. We're not talking about a place of shallowness. We're talking about a place of firstly laying down the foundation of what is necessary for the depths of God and His Word to sit in the spirits of men. Because most intimately with God is the nature of the of the, of the ground, okay? Is it dry ground? Is it sunny? Is it stony? Is it good ground? Because that's the difference between the 30, the 60, and the 100 fold. How we prepare the hearts of men. That's why the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that it's expedient that our heart be established, prepared in grace, and not in meats, okay? Like many people have been indulged in, the Bible says, wherein they have not been pro- profited. They profit not there in the things they've been occupied therein. So you're preaching, you're teaching, you're speaking things, you're sharing things that don't give you results, don't give the people results, don't give life to the people around you, neither give life to anything around you. But you're still sticking on something that doesn't work, okay? So again, we must understand the things that are necessary through the scriptures to lay the foundation of the ground. Many people have very different, funny ground, okay? So even though the truth of the gospel is coming to them, they are dry ground. So it falls and the and the, and the fall of air comes and bites of it. Why? Because the Bible says they have not understanding. But how can they not have understanding? Okay? Yet the Bible says with all thine getting, get understanding. Yet the Bible says that wisdom rests where understanding is. You know very well that the, 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 the mind of the Spirit in giving you knowledge ought to have the precedence of wisdom and understanding. Knowledge is third place for the process of a man being instructed of the Lord. Okay? When you say knowledge, you ought to have the understanding of the wisdom of what you know. Otherwise, if you don't know, sorry, if you know what you don't understand and whose wisdom you don't carry, you get where I'm coming from? If you are seeking to know of what you don't understand, of whose wisdom you don't carry, that is vain jangling. You are speaking from a mind perspective. You are ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But that is not how the Bible says, so you learn Christ. The distinctions of the gospel, the Bible says he has been made unto us wisdom. Hallelujah. The Bible says in him is hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in that person, the Bible says, Great is the mystery that was hid from the ages past and now revealed, which is Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. So if the Christ in whom all treasures of wisdom and knowledge were hid is inside me, it means that I must begin from the entity wisdom. I must understand that I carry wisdom because wisdom is the principal thing. And the Bible says, and wisdom rests where understanding is. Therefore, I'm prompted to seek understanding. Are you hearing me? In the wisdom I already carry by the finished work of Christ at the cross of Calvary. Because I don't, if I don't ap- appreciate what he has done and who he is in me, understanding cannot come. And therefore, knowledge can only come as information. Are you hearing me? And if a Christian is dealing on an information perspective, the Lord Jesus cannot speak to you. You see, many people have been lost in too many wanderings and therein have been pierced with many sorrows because they've become so committed to chasing what ought to pursue them because the persuasions of the things of God are not revealed unto them because of where they are standing as people. Are you hearing me? So, for example, need. When the Bible says that we are persuaded of greater things which accompany so your salvation, it means that the church has to preach a gospel above you're going to get a kind of house. Sometimes we have to preach it to help the person get a car. But after the car, what next? After that house, what next? After that child and that marriage, what next? So you have many people in church seated. They have cars and houses. They're smelling nice perfumes and very nice clothes. But they're useless in the kingdom. And they're very indifferent to the true convictions of the Spirit. That is why we're not preaching the gospel. Are you hearing me? Because we are not after a certain kind and mind of conviction of the Spirit out of the true place of positioning in the things of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So sometimes we, as a, as a people, as a ministry, or as believers in the body of Christ, we must understand that the primary mandate, in fact, the place that gives us the grace of eternity is simple. He says, and this is eternal life, that you might know the one true God and His only Son, Jesus Christ. But today in the church, we've presented eternal life as a life to come. Are you hearing me? This is eternal life, that you might know the one true God and His only Son, Jesus. If you know that one true God, you're in eternal life. Are you hearing me? So it has to be a present continuous experience of a man knowing the one true God and His only Son. I wish this is the panting of every soul in our generation. Today it's not the one true God and His only Son, Jesus. Today it's that DVD player and that school fees that you need on Thursday. And that's okay for a while. But why were we created? There has to be divine purpose. Are you hearing me? There has to be a reason why we come here every Thursday. There are people here who are parents. They left their kids at home. Are you hearing me? There are people here who have a lot of commitments. They are being called to go. But there is a reason why you invest your time in knowledge. Because you know that this is eternal life. One day in the house of the Lord is better than a thousand in the world. Are you hearing me? But you know how many Christians are so quick to leave the presence of God to go back and follow what? Telemundo. You understand? Fiction, okay? But that's for another day. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, when you are trying to define the place of knowledge here, sometimes there is a pain in your spirit of the indifference that is in the church and the Christendom abroad. You see, the Bible says that there is a way that seems rightful to every man, but the end thereof is what? Death, okay? Meaning that there are people in this world who are too convinced that they knew too much. Are you hearing? To be told. Yet the very people sometimes shall and are being weighed by the tides of the Spirit and their fond wanting. And that's why we're ministering questions, like Timothy says, rather than godly edification which is after faith. Are you hearing me? Now look at a church like Laodicea. They are a church. They have a choir. They have intercessors. They have projects. They have evangelism. You understand? They have ushers. They have everything on their side. They have all the kinds of instruments on their side. They have everything that they need to do the ministry that they ought to. Are you hearing me? The scriptures are clear that they are neither hot nor cold. Are you hearing me? But the Bible says, but they know not because they consider themselves rich. Are you hearing me? They consider themselves rich in the word, rich in things. You understand? They increase with goods. They have need for nothing. But listen, the Bible says, they know it's not that they are what? And what? And what? And what? And what? And naked. They're naked, they're blind, they're poor, they're miserable, they're wretched, but they know not. Because the surroundings around them deceive them. Are you hearing me? And when they do deceive them, they assume that they're in a better position than they actually are. And therefore, they can, because of that deception, feel like they have the grace to help people who are poor and need to grow. You get my point? And there is nothing that's painful and deceitful like Christians who know how to show patterns they don't leave. You understand? You pretend to pray, but you pray in public. When you're alone, you don't pray. You pretend to be a giver only when the cameras are watching you. But you're not a giver. You pretend to be a preacher only because you have to keep up appearances. But the back end of you has a very long line of pretense and indifference. You get where I'm coming from? And we can have a show for that as the church and say, oh, everything is going on well. Jesus is moving. You understand? Today, when you ask people, how was the meeting? They say glorious. You ask them, glorious. Do you even know the Greek definition of the word glorious? Doxa. All that God is and all that God has. So when you want to define a meeting and say that it was glorious, in that meeting was all that God is and all he has manifested. Or you want to get smoke machines, pump them up with smoke and say that this is the glory of God and get so excited and say, ay, 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 it was glorious. But really, at the end of the day, you're weighed and you're found excited rather than revelational. That's why, when, for example, when you read the book of Revelation, do you know that many people think 
that it's called the book of Revelations. <laughs> they didn't get it, did they? You get it? They think it's a total sum of the things God revealed to John the Baptist. That is why if a man ought to function in the spirit of revelation, I'm talking about the spirit of revelation, that man ought to understand this book. Because judgment is therein. Why? If the Bible says that we shall be judged by the law that set us free, do you realize that there is a blessing for any man which reads the book of revelation? <laughs> and a curse to whosoever removeth the word? But you see, sometimes we only want to paint of what is going to come. Oh, and then there was a crying, and then there was a burning of incense, which were the prayers of the saints, who was worthy to open the scroll. And the Lamb of God is, oh, is, is worthy to open the scroll. But they don't understand that distinctively the scriptures have been clear from beginning, that anywhere there is a scroll is a move of the Spirit. You get it? It's not just the scroll, it's a move of the Spirit. So when you see the prayers of the saints which are as incense, the mind of men which are interceding for the next move of the Spirit, are you hearing me? If there ought to be scrolls that are opened by the Son of God, there ought to be men dispensed enough in the spirit realm to read those scrolls. Least men read from what is from the earth. You see, it's one thing to say that let the things on the earth teach us the things in heaven. But it's another when you understand that you are in Christ. <laughs> which created the heavens and the earth, in whom all things consist. Okay? So yes, I can look at the things of the world to teach me of the things in the heavens. But you see, deeper than that, I want to see, look at the, see, the words, Paul calls them the words of this life. That I might understand the life which is of God, because that's, that, that to me is the most important testimony for every believer. So for example, when you read in the book of Revelation, okay, the reason why many people think it's the book of Revelations is because they think it's a total sum of what the Lord is speaking to John the Baptist. And there really corrects them and tells them, no, this is deeper than just that. The spirit of prophecy in Revelations is actually the testimony of Jesus Christ. So therefore, if you understand the testimony of Jesus Christ, you'll understand the book of Revelation succumbs so back to prophecy. So, for example, if I have the Spirit, the Bible says, and the Spirit of the Lord shall show you things to come, okay? If He says that He shall reveal unto you the things to come, don't you realize that, for example, if you are in the Scriptures, the eyes of your understanding have to be opened of the things that ought to come. In fact, when you're dealing with John the Revelator, right in the book of Revelation, okay? You realize that when things get too much for Him and He's too hit with all these things God is downloading on His, on his Spirit, He says, you know, come quickly. You get to, of like, come quickly. This is something heavy. <laughs> you understand? From the spirit of a man trying to receive what is actually revelation of the person of Jesus Christ, not just revelations of things to come. For example, church at Laodicea. Okay? How can we see people who don't know that they're miserable, who don't know that they're poor, who don't know that they don't know, who don't know that they don't understand, who don't know that they're so far from truth, yet they feel that they are this, they are that, and therefore they are lukewarm. Are you hearing me? Now, this is the funny thing. The funny thing, the scriptures say, Behold, I knock at the door. Meaning, listen, if you're dealing with a church, and Jesus is knocking on the door, you don't get me, do you? If you're dealing with a church, and Jesus is knocking on the door, who was in the church? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? When did he leave? How can he be too desperate to a place where he says, if any man, you understand, even if it's an usher, I don't care. Let somebody just open for me. I'll enter in. Listen, he didn't say, I'm dying with them. Are you hearing me? The scriptures say that I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come in to him. Are you hearing me? And will sup with him, and he with me. That means that if any man in the church of Laodicea opens the door of the church to Christ, he's not going to come in and come on the pulpit. He's going to go to that man. Now, do you see the biggest problem with that kind of church? The biggest problem with that kind of church 
is a pastor who chased Christ long ago and a church member who eats with Christ every day. Now at the end of the day, who ought to be teaching? You get my point? The laymen who you see seated back in there, are you hearing me? In the back, are actually dining with the Christ. While the men on the pulpit have refused Christ on their pulpit. And the men there are trying to receive from men who no longer have the Christ. It's so ironic. You get my point? So at the end of the day, sometimes you're going to see a certain schism, a certain division in the body of Christ. Not necessarily because the man out there has a problem, but because the man eating with Christ, he has a different conversation from the man standing on the pulpit. And there now comes a different issue. You're saying things, but every time I read the Bible, I see there is a difference from what you're telling me and what I'm reading in the Scriptures. Pastor, what is wrong with me? You see the problem with you? You are rebellious. You think that you're smarter than I. You think that you're the greatest there is. Who told you that what you're preaching is so? If you don't want, get out of my church and go start your own. But what I'm preaching is what I know to be standing true. And sometimes people keep quiet and either they are consumed in the confirmation. Are you hearing me? Or have to probably look for another place where they have to get answers. And when they start to get answers, they have a problem because they are church hoping. Oh, Christians, why don't you settle in your own ministries? Why do you go from church to church, ministry to ministry? Let me tell you, sir, when a man has eaten with Jesus Christ and you bring another meal, he will get the difference. The Bible says we have an altar from which they don't eat from. Are you hearing me? And at the end of the day, we're saying, oh, today's Christians, they are hoping in churches. Listen, God is the one moving them. Listen, the Bible says in Amos that in the last days, I shall put a famine, not of bread or water, but of the word. And it says they shall move north. They shall go east to east and coast. Why are they moving? He's causing a famine and a hunger. They are hungry to hear a God who they can relate with because every time they are eating with him, they are reading something different from what we are giving them every Sunday. And then we think they are the problem. And then we make them unbelievers, cults, deserters of the faith, lost and fallen. You understand? Disconnected from the life of God. We cast them all we want. But you know what? We just lost the man who dines with Christ. And he again goes back to the door to knock. Until another one will open. And then the dining comes in. And then he eats, and then he also leaves. And then until another one, he comes and opens. So you're trying to bring in what Christ is pulling out. You're trying to evangelize what Christ is pulling out. The Bible speaks of shepherds who have eaten the sheep. They have eaten, figuratively, the sheep. Are you with me? So, so, that's why I tell fellow ministers and pastors, please don't blame people when they leave you. He was clear. If you raise me up, I will torment to myself. If you are raising me up, they ought to come and they will come. Because what? They are hungry. So at the end of the day, you ask yourself, how did tradition after tradition, mind after mind, doctrine after doctrine, precept, concept after concept, teaching after teaching, worship after worship, take this guy, the Christ, off that pulpit, and men stayed with Jesus, had a form of godliness. Are you hearing me? And then a guy falls his face and says, Fascinating. The Spirit of God is here. And people fall down. <laughs> you understand? Not because Christ is in the room. But because the giftings and callings of God are without repentance. Are you hearing me? You understand? You understand? So you can see activity. But not ministry. You get? Because they think that the more you demonstrate is the more you approve the worker. Let me tell you. The scriptures are clear. Study the word. That you might be approved a worker that accurately divides the word of truth, that you might not be ashamed. Our vindications are not what men think about us when we do or not, even though we have to, because the word of God is power. Are you hearing me? 
Our vindication entirely goes past the giftings of the Spirit. Because you see, sometimes we can be so engaged in what God can do through us by the giftings, and we forget that if these giftings and callings are without repentance, how about the assignment of God upon our lives? You think God is going to tell you, I'm going to use you to revive the nation, and you refuse, and he's going to leave you there and wait for you to make up your mind to revive the nation? No. He will look for another man available. Are you with me? You understand? He will look for another man available. That's why a man can simply fall in a meeting and then know what is going on and just say, Whom shall we send? Send me. He doesn't even know where he's going. He says, send me. And the Lord says, okay, so you are the available. Let me tell you, I always tell people there is a place for men who are available. Not everybody will go to that meeting. Not everybody will take that step. Not everybody will go in the hardest places of the world. But there are men who avail themselves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Was grace for the man originally to move? Yes, grace was available. Okay? But you see, the church has a responsibility. That's why I was sharing on Sunday in the book of uh, the Amplified Bible of Hosea. And I told people, every time people read that person's scripture, they make it speak what it's not speaking. He says that my people generally are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And he says, because you, the priestly nation, have rejected knowledge, they are destroyed and therefore I'll reject you. See, he's saying, we, the priestly nation, have rejected knowledge and therefore people outside are destroyed. So, who is responsible for people not getting saved? You understand? Instead of telling them the reason, Lord, the person of Jesus Christ, His grace, His righteousness imputed by faith, you understand? The power working in a man to revive them, we're still telling them about the generation curse of their uncles, cousins, auntie. You understand that spirit of the uncles, cousins, brother, which has mounted the new creation. And then they're in deliverance services, trying to rebuke and fight what they don't even understand. And then we engage them in wars until they die, without having seen the Christ. That's why people love going to places where people are speaking about demons. What has the Lord showed you? What have you seen? Dem- oh my God. What has the Lord told you? <laughs> are you hearing me? But God wants to raise you to a place where you know and hear Him. He says a new covenant I make with them. Not as that one which I made with them in the wilderness. That they could not continue therein. But a new covenant I make with them. He says, and all shall know the Lord. None shall say to, him, say to his neighbor, know the Lord. For from the first to the last. He says, for all will know me. And I will forgive their iniquity. And I will remember their sin no more. To the preacher, to the worshiper, to the, to the guy at the door. They know God. They know God. Are you hearing? But tonight, or in our generation today, everybody that sees something small work on them, even if a guy just lays a hand on a guy and the eye sees, and he says, ah, now the Lord has called me. He, he goes on a, and then he gets a hammer, pua, pua, and then puts up a what? Something international, you understand? Something, something international. Are you hearing me? You understand? Or probably go and inconvenience a certain gullible person. Oh, let us share your room. If the, Lord, the Lord does not despise humble beginnings. You understand? Even the guy who has come into the ministry, he's unexperienced and unskilled in the word. Hebrews is clear. Some don't even understand the simplest doctrine of righteousness. You understand? They still are in the righteousness of the law. Many things. It's very sad to hear. You get? So, at the end of the day, this guy is also what? Excited. You understand? Oh, at most, if he is too desperate, he will look for a man of God and tell him, Sir, I feel the Lord has told me to join your ministry. Are you hearing me? But you see, there's a difference between Timothy and Peter. Peter is associate pastor. Timothy is son. They didn't get me. Then you ask yourself, what makes him associate? And have you ever seen an associate with the same vision? Listen, he says when Peter, which, and John and James, when they saw the grace which was given unto me to the uncircumcised, as it was to them to the circumcised, 
They gave me and Panabas the right hand of fellowship. Associate pastors never have the same visions with the senior pastors. They're just there to survive long enough to have a hick and then one time blow you where it hurts and then they carry their own members and take them to another ministry and say, that guy is not so deep. I don't feel him anymore. You come and I take you where there is milk and honey, yet there are no cows and bees. You understand that? <laughs> That is why I have a huge, as an apostle, I have a huge problem with associates who are not sons. Because how can we reproduce our ministries in people? For he says you had many instructors in the Lord, but a few fathers. Oh no, me, I don't need anybody. The spirit of God is my spiritual father. Okay, continue. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue, hallelujah. Debate all you want. Are you hearing me? But whether you want it or not, there are instructors and their fathers. You get where I'm coming from? So, Peter has another vision. Paul has another vision. They can meet and have a common sense of working together. But really, he's working with you only until he goes through. The day it goes through, the way he will live will be different. You understand? He will say, the Lord told me. And you're not going to feel what the Lord told him. Because he was not a son. He was an associate. Is it bad to be an associate? It is not bad to be an associate. But we should know the difference between submission and accountability and just sitting to tell a man you're just helping him work together. The church of Christ is not a business. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a life. Are you hearing me? You're dodging accountability because you're associate pastor. So who is your father? Who is your pastor? Associate pastor. Oh no, my associate pastor is a senior pastor, so then, why, my, my, my pastor is my spiritual father, but I'm also the associate, so why are you associating? Are you hearing me? Let the lawyers do that, not the church. You will never understand this, but I don't even know where they got it from the gospel. Why do you think Paul was not always on the pulpit with Peter? Because the grace given on them is different. We can meet at Jerusalem and I need your back, Peter. Because these guys don't understand that salvation doesn't need circumcision. But after that, let me go. I know that you might have opened the door to the Gentile church when you went to the house of Cornelius. I acclaim that God has anointed you enough to open that door. But you must be mature enough to understand that it is for me to enter. Are you hearing me? If you refuse to open it, another man will open it and I will still enter. But if you dare come into the territories the Lord has sent me, you write things and say the brethren in Rome greet you, I am sure they will hang you upside down. You are going to say it was persecution, but what were you doing in Rome, Peter? God called you in Jerusalem. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now we, we have all kinds of guys, two, 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 and then some just come, to, and then they're just wrong seeds. You understand? I, I wish I had a pastor here. They would say what you're saying is true. Do I have pastors here? Do you know there are people who are just in ministries to break them? You understand? They're there, they're humbling themselves and saying, no, 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 no. They're leading program, but only to break them. <laughs> because, <laughs> like you're to the circumcised, they are to the uncircumcised. And chances are that there are some uncircumcised people. <laughs> so, you're building on another man's ministry. You're surviving on his air and electricity. You don't understand what I'm trying to tell you. You're marrying a, a woman in your father's house and producing children. You don't get it, do you? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because everything, the moment something comes on us, we feel, oh, the Lord has called me. He just starts to shake his hands like this. Oh, the Lord has called me. I feel fire. I feel fire. You get where I'm coming from? Do you see where I'm coming from? Why do you think we didn't start like any other ministry? Why do you think our first meeting held 1,200 people? You think it was by mistake? No, sir. We have the blessing of the man of the house. And he said, I bless you. You get where I'm coming from? We come from somewhere. You get my point? We're just not born again yesterday and got excited and got a few metallic things. Now the Lord has called. You understand? 
And then you see some people, hey, me, I'm a prophet. And then they prophesy something so off. And you're like, oh God. And they can't come back in. You understand? They're too unstable. Are you hearing me? And you see, every time you disturb the Spirit of God, you later start to reject Him without knowing. And that's the funny thing about Christians. You start to reject Him without knowing. And because you can cause the gift to move in your life, you still live with a deception of men coming in, you, in your ministry because of gifts. If men are attached to you because of gifts, you better seek God. You understand? Because convictions in the Spirit go even beyond what men ought to receive to function. They go to the heart of the Spirit of God. What does He want? He willeth that all men be saved and none should perish. That's why you realize many Christians don't have conviction. They just have need. They've been hit by the Spirit of the world. It's always competition and money 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 and money. You understand? Primitive accumulation. Even the money they have, they, they will not use it, but they will rather die. You understand? You understand? You will look at Christians and you're thinking, oh God, what's happening? They're in the world competing with each other. You get? And at the end of the day, people are saying, oh, what is wrong with the church? God, we are believing you, you for revival. No. <laughs> Before we get revival, God deal with us. You get my point? Before we what? We get revival. God deal with the individual, us. Look at Luke. Luke said, <laughs> in verse 1, okay, he says that many people attempted to account the story of Jesus. Some of you think that only four men wrote. No. He says, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of these things which are most surely believed amongst us. That means many people wrote the story of Jesus. Are you hearing me? Many men wrote down the account of Jesus. Are you? So it's not only Mark, John, and Luke, and Matthew. No. Many try to take a hand to set forth the order. A declaration of those things was most surely believed amongst us. Many people saw the Christ. Many people wrote about Jesus Christ. But you see, the thing on them was not enough to be qualified, to be kept up to 2015. You never understand what I'm saying. That is why people sing songs and after two weeks they're not anywhere. That's why people preach sermons and they can't stay eternal. Why? Because what is on them only lasts for a night. It's like the very spirit of the world. If he unleashes the dragon and his Cisco, when he comes to Uganda, his concert will flop because people are tired of unleashing dragons. Bring another song on snakes or scorpions, but please don't give me unleashing the dragons. And some sermons are starting to sound like unleash the dragon. They are too old. Unpredictable. Same testimony. In 1965, I ate a goat. Same testimony. In 1965, I ate a goat. If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, He ought to be working in you every day. A new thing. Raise a person today. Tomorrow, open a blind eye. Next year, change something. But God in Jesus Christ in your life must seem like an ever increasing life of glory. From glory to glory, to the very image and station, to the fullness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to avoid putting revival meetings attached to monuments of yesterday. We want to preach a Jesus who is presently moving, living and alive in the inside of our spirits. That when you're speaking, it sounds like it's fresh from heaven, has been fried by a particular angel and thrown on us. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor it is working. In my life. So, Luke realizes there are many who are writing. I'm not just going to write. I'm not just going to preach. I'm not just going to worship. Are you hearing me? I'm not just going to teach. No. He says in the second verse, eh? he says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers. Oh my God. They are also ministers of the word. They wrote, they were ministers of the word, but God says, uh uh-uh. uh. You don't know him enough to speak about him. I know you have a good book, sir. It has three volumes on the anointing, but you don't know me. You don't understand what I'm saying. Do you? Yes, you do. A guy has written a book. He's saying, oh, this is my book. I've written a book on prosperity, but he's broke. 
physician. You're broke. You're teaching me about money. The guy has two members in the church. He's teaching about church growth. Are you, that, that's so ironic. And he can't be taught by somebody who has a million people. Because he's too proud to be taught. But he's also teaching. And then you sell two, four, five copies and people read it and say, "Mm -mm, it ain't it. I'm looking for something. When I find it, I will know. God give you songs that will make men lose sleep. God give you revelation that will cause men to lose appetite. God give you visions that will cause men to, 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 to pay millions of dollars just to get to you in the name of Jesus. Actually, what I'm seeing in church is tired folk. Folk are tired because I might not be on the pulpit, but I can smell what is the true Holy Spirit. I, I might not be preaching on that pulpit, but I can smell if it is true revelation. I, I might not be deep and you might have never seen me in your conference, but I smell what it is when distinctions come in. I know what it sounds like. So if I don't come and you think I have a problem, you know it's not that you're poor. So, Next verse. Luke says, Because uh, uh, it seemed uh, good to me also, having had, listen to him, had perfect understanding of all these things from the very first to write to you in order, most excellent Theophilus. But Thou mightest epignosis the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Oh, the word epignosis is not gnosko or prognosko. It's not the adopted spirit to learn something new in Fanero on the first day. No, it is that ever perfect knowledge of God established in the nature of God, knowing who you are by the life of the Spirit working in you because of the unction seated on you. For he says that we have an unction from on high. We know all things. So we are not speaking as learning men on Tuesday trying to tell people what we learned. You understand? That is, that is, that is, that is, that is, that is cell. You understand? The smallest what? One of the smallest living things. That is what people call cell groups. They are okay. Are you hearing me? But you see, some people have only the grace of cell group, but they are teaching and preaching. Are you hearing me? And that's where the problem is. That's why their churches are not growing. Because the anointing on them is a cell group. And they are trying to stand in front of 3,000 or 20 or 100,000 people. Why? The thing on them has not increased glory to live cell. They are cell members, cell people, supposed to be sharing cell. But they are trying to raise a ministry called Da 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 International. And then the work mocks you. The Bible says, because you counted not your cost. You counted the cost of engines, machines, the rent that you needed, the few choir members, and the ultimate piano, which you know not even how to pray, play. Sorry, But you did not count the true cost of the gospel. Now, Luke tells you, let's go back to four. Luke tells you, having, ha- having, having, that thou mayst epignosis. Are you hearing me? That you made epignosis. Okay? The reason why I'm taking time to understand and teach you in the order of the things of the understanding is that I might shift you from gnosko, advancing only, to a place of advanced epignosko. That's the advanced knowledge of God. That now when the psalmist says that the Lord has given me the tongue of the land to know how to speak a word to him that is weary in season, I'm not speaking as a learning man. Are you hearing me? Because if you're teaching me to ride a bike and you're also falling, I don't understand how I can be perfect in that bike. Don't you see that there's a problem? And the rebellious boy also looks for other people to release an anointing on. And he says, God has told me that you're going to be a pastor. (laughs) Really? Really? You? You're laying hands? (laughs) You're laying hands? You rebelled. You're very funny. You're indifferent. You're also laying hands? Now, does that surprise you why we have many churches in our nation, but many are shallow? And amazingly, do you know Do you know that the people who sense the shallowness of churches are people who have never stood on the pulpit? They know how to sense the true thing. 
Because these days, a man can say, You have to give. And the guy stands up. But was that revelation? <laughs> Is that revelation? Come on, somebody. I feel in the spirit that you don't need to tell the, 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 the Lord, the devil, your problems. Tell the devil, you don't need to tell how big your problems are, but you need to tell the devil how big your God is. And somebody stands up. But you see, is that so deep? Is that all you got? My God, he's a deep preacher. Did you hear what he said? He said that do not tell God how big your problems are. But tell your problems how big your God is. You even make it a WhatsApp profile. <laughs> While in the back end, there are men whose hearts are indicting a good matter. Their hearts are indicting a what? A good matter. And their tongue is like a pen of a ready writer. Are you hearing me? They are speaking of things which they have touched concerning the king. They understand and touched him. They felt and tested. That which we have seen, touched and tested concerning the word of life. We preach unto you that your fellowship will be with us. For our fellowship is with the Father. They have touched. And Paul sees that difference and says, Ah. Oh, I would rather not speak of the things which Christ has not wrought in me. He didn't say by me. He said in me. Work in me enough that what I'm speaking from is a source of experience of what I share with you rather than the gift on me that stirs up my head to speak things I don't even understand. Because therein are so many patterns that I will not leave. And then I will look so disqualified. Yet the men I'm ministering to are actually getting qualified every other day. God help us. So, he says, you see, I want to have a perfect understanding. He says, from the first, because the things of the gospel have an order. The first things are first. So when Paul speaks of the first principles of the oracles, are you hearing me? Some people think the Bible is every oracle, but he says there are first principles of the oracles. There are secondary principles of the oracles. There are third principles of the oracles. And consequently come with the dimensions of the spirit. Now men are still in the repent. Listen, he says, and now let not, he tells us of, 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 of what? Of the place where we have to go past the first principles of the oracles. Are you hearing me? And the first thing he mentions is what? Repentance from dead works. That's the first thing of the first principles. Meaning, if a man is still preaching the law, he's still in the first principles of the oracles, but he's a senior pastor. He doesn't even know the difference between law and grace. Because law is, is, is dead works. The things that you do to pull up a God, instead of responding to what he has done to pull you up, that's religion. I know it's okay for evangelists to reach out to sinners, but I told people, revival can only be described when sinners are looking for church. Get convicted on the road enough to look for somebody to preach to them and they have questions. Why? Because the convictions of the Spirit are deeper than how much... We, listen. Repentance from dead works. He says, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go unto perfection. Listen. Not laying again the foundation of... Repentance from dead works. The first thing is repenting from dead works. The place of changing your mindset from the works of the law to the ministration of grace. Now, there are men who have a problem already with the grace message. Where are they? They've not understood the first things. Are you hearing me? And they are writing to Theophilus. That's why the church in Jerusalem died. Because they maintained the Moses when the Christ was bringing grace and truth. But they repeat the same mistakes. That's why their ministries are dying. Every day their ministries are dying. Because what they are preaching is not life. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? So, this guy says, no, let me have an understanding firstly. And then write to you in a particular order. So that you understand that the gospel is an order. 
So when Paul speaks of how men ought to behave in the house of the Lord, he's not talking about just moral conduct of walking humbly. No. He's talking about the way we ought to respond when we are in the presence of God. You're in churches that don't even understand who God is. The guy can sit in a church and chew bubble gum and talk with you. So, which phone did you buy? The inner for the service. You get where I'm coming from? But deeper than that, there is a silent man who is not speaking anything. But if you have to weigh him, he's strange to proper. Some of you don't even understand what I'm saying. He, he, you're preaching, but he's judging you, not even on the terms of the spirit. You understand? He's judging you as according to his carnal sense. Because again, he's not spiritual son. He's associate. <laughs> he's Peter. He has another vision. You get where I'm coming from? <laughs> Do you see? And then people are saying, oh, God, what is happening to the church? Exactly. Men who are not fit to minister are ministering. So, the guy says, uh-uh. Let me have a perfect understanding of these things. Says that you might know, you might epignosis the certainty. The word there for certainty is the Greek word for security and security of the things which you've been instructed. Says that when a man stands instructed by the Spirit, they have a security of what they know. When he says God heals, he'll say, bring that clutch. And you're going to bring it because he knows what he's talking about. When he says that God answers prayer, he's not speaking from a perspective of an excited spirit. He knows that God answers prayer. When he goes on his knees to pray, he's not just praying because he's too desperate to pray. He's praying because he knows the God who always hears him. That place where you're sure of everything that you're doing in God because you're too aligned to the instruction of advanced knowledge. Because you're taught by men who know, take time firstly to know the things in their order before they write. Now, we are out of order preaching to men who want to understand an order and qualifying them as instructors of the things out of order. And they are also preaching disorder. You have a demon. Amen. You don't have a demon. Amen. You're rich. Amen. You're not rich. Amen. I see a demon in you. You have it. I don't have it. You're this. You're that. They are hot. They are cold. They are, today they are short. They are tall. You understand? That's why in Second Chronicles, probably let me finish because of time. 13 5, he says, Oh, ye. He's asking a question. Oh, ye not. To know. Don't you carry the knowledge that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his son, by a, sons by a covenant of salt. But you see, let me tell you how they read it. They read it like this. Oh, ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom of Israel to David forever. They didn't understand what I said. Did you? Some people, when they read over, they think of. <laughs> he gave the kingdom over Israel to David and his sons by a covenant of salt. And then he comes in Matthew. 513, 513, 5, he says, Ye are that salt, you are the covenant by which the sons of David carry the kingdom. When John the Baptist sees it, he says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is nigh. Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is nigh. Matthew claims and says, Oh no, I know that the, the spam in him is not of David. But this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Because I realize I'm Jew. And the only way I can share the promise is by claiming I'm a son of David and bringing him in by faith because he carries the entity kingdom. And that kingdom is over Israel. It's not by flesh and blood, but it is of the spirit. Now, the ministrations of men who understand not these things, minister as to the kingdom of this world. That is why when Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? He says, if my kingdom was of this world, I would fight battles of this world. 
But my kingdom is not of this world. I'm not fighting for things in this world. There is nothing in this world that is in for me. And neither does the prince of this world have me. Now, today, there are ministers who are fighting over the kingdom. They are fighting for the kingdom of Israel. Can I shock you? Actually, the, the Hebrew word in Chronicles, the word there for over, is the word also defined as against. You study. Don't, don't say, okay? Not as against fighting, but as against different. So he's saying that he gave the kingdom of, to David, the kingdom. Sorry, let's go back to Chronicles 13.5. Probably, let me give it to you. He says, ought you not to know that the Lord God gave the kingdom that is in the sense of against different to that of Israel, to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt. And that soul, you, is the entity that David looks back at and realizes, oh my God, those are the only promise for my sons to have the kingdom forever. Because they carry the one who gives life, and that is Jesus Christ. And while we are preaching Christ dead and resurrected, some are hidden forms and persons and doctrines, Judistic, Hellenistic, things that profit not them which are occupied there. Grow up. Somebody speak in other tongues. Get to your feet. Sorry, Patala. I want you to just take a minute and speak to Jesus. In your own words, you tell him from the things that I've shared, you, I pray that it has caused the hunger in your spirit. Your eyes on the sparrow And your hand, he comforts me from the end of the year to the death of my heart, let your mercy and strength be seen. You call me to your purpose. Hunger to know God, a thing shows understanding.
We are believing for a generation that can just hunger to know. We know you need cars and houses, that's okay. But can you just hunger to know? says that I love your word more than my meat. I pray that you love his word more than even the food that you eat. I pray that you hunger for him day and night that your hands pant after him. Oh God yes, I will run Father, I thank you that the entrance of your word brings light and giveth understanding to the simple. And tonight we don't go out like we came because the words that you speak to us, they are spirit and they are life. They are changing me, they are changing everyone in the name of Jesus. And we are moving forward and upward only in Jesus' name. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.